Hello everyone and welcome back to the workshop. Today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. Restoring something instead of making something. But before I explain that, I want to talk about the old adage many people say about how tools just aren't built the same way that they used to be. Old tools were just built to a different standard, and having handled many old tools and new tools and comparing them to each other, I can really say that old tools are just tough and long-lasting, save for the rust on a lot of old tools, which was no fault of the tool itself, but poor storage on the owner. I personally think that it's better to restore old tools and use them, rather than go get new tools, because frankly, I would expect the old tools to last longer, just because they were built to a tougher standard. And that brings me to the tools themselves. Stamped on many of them are the initials EP, or Ernest Potter, my grandfather's grandfather, or my great-great-grandfather, an engineer from the state of South Australia. And these were his tools, which served him well throughout his life. These tools have since been passed down many generations, and have ended up with me in this workshop. So these are, in a sense, a family heirloom. These and many other tools that I have of his in the workshop are in various condition. Some of them he made, and some he bought at great expense as a lifetime investment. He wasn't particularly rich, and many of these tools were imports from Germany, the USA, and England. These tools were cared for during their life, so I think it's up to me to ensure that they get cleaned up and further cared for. And that brings us on to the restoration itself. Restoration is a category in and of itself here on YouTube, and it takes on many different meanings and forms. Some people take tools back to factory condition by sanding away any dents, reapplying any paint, making sure all the mechanism works, and making the tool go back to its former glory. Others take tools beyond factory condition by polishing tools to a mirror finish, probably to a state better when they left the factory. And I'm not going to sit here and say one is right or wrong, but that won't work for what I want. My aim is to take the tool back to a usable and stable condition so it can be used here in the workshop. As far as I'm concerned, removing scratches and marks would be wrong for these tools. They were made or owned by my great-great-grandfather, and the scratches are a part of the history of the tool, which I think is wrong to remove. All I want to do is remove the red surface rust that is eating away the tool, and leave it at that. As for removing the rust, I want to be as gentle as I can be, for two reasons. First, because these are still precision instruments. After more than a century, the sides are still square, and they have very precise markings, so rough abrasives would be the wrong method. And there are also a lot of fine engravings, ranging from the fine divisions to the very fine hand engravings, which need to be treated with care. The easiest way to remove the rust would have been electrolysis, but I wanted to shy away from it. Electrolysis is really only needed for the worst affected tools, and it can also attack the underlying metal, which we want to do everything to protect. That's why, for these tools, which are in pretty good condition, I'm choosing to use Scotch-Brite and Fine Particle Cleaner. It's a very forgiving method to remove the rust, and it removes the rust very easily. It just takes a lot of effort and time. Now, I could have used Phosphoric Acid to easily remove it. Phosphoric acid is great because it only attacks the rust, but I had the Scotch Bright in the workshop and I wanted to show that it really wasn't necessary to resort to chemicals straight out of the box. Well, 
One thing you might have noticed is that whilst we are removing a lot of the red rust very easily, there is still a little bit of black oxide that is left. The black oxide is a type of rust that is created in low oxygen environments, typically underneath red rust. And it is a lot more stable than the red rust and it is a lot harder to remove. Now the phosphoric acid could easily remove it, but I do like the look of the black oxide. And if the tool is stored properly with a thin film of oil, I think it should be fine and the oxide shouldn't propagate. I'll also note that on the squares, which were in worse condition, have a lot of pitting where the rust has actually eaten holes or pits into the tool surface. I have cleaned out the rust, save for some of the black oxide, but unfortunately with these pits there's very little that we can do, save for make sure that the rust doesn't get any worse. As a quick aside here, the cleaning has revealed that under the rust there's an engraving showing that this square dates from at least 1899, which means this square is 122 years old and it will soon be put back into service and it's still square too. That is just a testament to how tough and durable these tools are. And I'll also note, look at the rivets which were used to put this tool together. That is eight individual rivets. No wonder that after 122 years old, this square is still going strong. Well, to wrap things up, I hope you enjoyed the video today. I'm very happy with the results. There was certainly a great tool underneath the layer of rust. This video certainly is different to many other restorations here on YouTube, but it really does capture the vintage look that I was going for. Here in the workshop, I have many other vintage tools of his that all have the same basic look, and they all have a little bit of black oxide, maybe a little bit of tarnish after 100 years, and the last thing I would want is to have tools that of his that look different. I wanted them all to have the same overall look, and I think I have been able to capture that. I think a thin film of oil will ensure a long service life and protect it from rust. Thanks for watching.